What is up, everybody? It's Jeremy Miller, your host of the Higher and Fire podcast, brought to you by Pyra Consulting. We got episode number 13 today uh, with myself, uh, Chad Sandy, and a special guest, Amanda Anderson, who is the director of digital marketing over at eCreative. We're talking about management today, everything about management. So enjoy the show, and we'll come back again next week with another. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Episode number 13 of the Hire and Fire podcast. I, like usual, am Jeremy Miller, your host. I'm the founder and CEO of Pyra Consulting, but you don't care about that. You care about Chad Sandy. Hi, Chad Sandy. How's it going? Tonto. Tonto. <laughs> um, we also are super excited to have Amanda Anderson in here. Amanda will introduce herself shortly on what she does, but we are going to be talking about management today. And that's it. No subtopics. We're going to tell stories about management, how we've experienced it, how, what types of managers we've liked, what types of managers we want to be, um, all kinds of stuff. So that's kind of where we are. So Amanda, say hi. Hey. Hi. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to give us a spiel of who you are? Sure. Um, hey, everyone. I am Amanda. I'm the sales and marketing director over at eCreative uh, in St. Louis Park. And we build uh, websites and do digital marketing for the industrial B2B market. Damn, that sounds fancy. Um, it does. Fancy. Yes. For our, <laughs> for our non-Minnesota listeners, if there are people out there, um, we're all from Minnesota, and that's what we're going to bring to the table, except for weirdos like me who are originally from the East Coast. But uh, nonetheless, management. <laughs> Here we are. So... Um, have you been in a hiring and firing managerial role, Mr. Chad Sandy? I have. And did you enjoy it and do you want to do it again? Uh, it was, well, I was fortunate enough. It was sort of um, management, uh, part of a management team. There were four of us. So it kind of took some of the edge off the, the firing part. The hiring was fun, but the firing, you, when I think back, tended to be there was and we all wore the different hats. Sometimes you were the good cop, and sometimes you were the bad cop. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I had to fire my share of people, <laughs> or give them the option, you know, performance plan or mm -hmm. shake your hand. Yeah, I, yeah. I was in a lead capacity for years, so I had the managerial clout inside of the organization. Um, a, based on my tenure and the given title, I was a part of the management team. I traveled nationally and did a lot of training, but very little, if any, firing. Okay. So mm -hmm. when I started this organization three years ago, I knew that that would be the immediate role that I would have to take. And I fired the first person I ever hired. So that wasn't really hard for me only because I was fortunate to where I knew that as long as I like set good expectations, mm -hmm. that firing somebody would not be an utter shock. So that first person you hired, was it because they didn't meet the expectations? Or was it they didn't meet the expectations and there was some shenanigans or culture fit issues going on that made it easy to fire that person? Uh, maybe a little bit of both because we weren't in this office yet. So we were scaling the organization. There was literally two of us who started the company and we knew we were ready to start hiring. And we had enough business on the board that needed to be worked on that like we needed help. We couldn't handle it, the both of us, yeah. but we weren't physically in here yet. So I ended up finding a guy who was perfect from my perspective that could do the job and do it remote. So my mm -hmm. first hire right out of the gate was a 100% remote person. That's tough. 100%, Yeah, right? yeah, that's tough. So I'm giving him automatic, unbelievable flexibility. Right. And all we were doing was connecting daily, and then once a week we'd go have coffee together. And he was just the wrong person. Like, he just didn't have the it factor. He didn't have the work ethic. He didn't really, really want it. It was just kind of like a bird in hand. So how, how did you do it? At a coffee shop. So in person. So was it a shock though? Did you do the performance implant, improvement plans? Sort of. Because here's the thing. A firing should never be a shock. Yeah. 
Did you? Did I steal that from you, or did you steal that from me, or did I we think, both come up with that separately? I have no idea. Okay, but that is, I think yes. that it should never be a and, shot. And, and we we were too new, too young, too small to have a really good procedures in place. Sure. He actually helped me learn how I wanted to go about that. Okay. So then I started spending a significant amount of time before hiring again, writing all of that shit. Yeah. You know, like the not fun, I need to write procedures and who likes procedures? Nobody. Right. But we all need these processes. So I had to write them based on my own mentality of what it would look like and come up with a managerial plan. He just kind of proved that even after challenging him, sure. asking for more, that he just didn't have anything to offer. And I'm like, okay, we're at, at the infant stages here, and I'm not going to pay you your salary if you're not even at a minimum hitting 50% yeah. of what you're capable of. So, so well, you, if you're not even paying for your salary at that point, like, then they're not beneficial. If they're not giving enough to at least pay for themselves. So he wasn't so. really shocked? Or was, or was he? Yeah. Um, I think he was a little. He was okay. So based on what you just described, where I hundred percent agree, nobody should be fired outside of like doing something really, really dumb, right? Like if you, if if you're busted doing drugs on the job, or like you physically fight with somebody, or like one of those automatic out of nowhere you're fired moments, right? Outside the of on the spot, correct? Stuff, yeah. Outside of the on the spot, you just made an irrevocable mistake. Yeah. Um, you should never have somebody who's like super duper surprised. And, um, I don't, I don't think I had my mind wrapped around that yet with him. And then now I've had enough experience, enough hirings, enough firings, enough performance management. Um, I have a little bit more of a process and a relationship building dynamic and process that we do here that even when someone's struggling, like I can start tipping them off to that, then eventually I can get a little bit more aggressive on it. Yeah. I've had to give people verbal warnings and I've had to write up written warnings and all that stuff. You have to write employee manuals about, you know, uh, you know, performance improvement plans and, and, uh, um, I can't think of the right terminology, but basically just, you know, if someone's going to be leaving here, what is it going to look like? Well, it's not very complicated. It's normally verbal, written, verbal, written goodbye. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, but you, you have to be the one who is going to pull that trigger. Now, I don't have anybody else above me that has to check off on these. So mm -hmm. it's a hundred percent on me, which mm -hmm. sometimes is very convenient because I don't need buy-in. Yeah. And then other times it's just on me. So, but if you're not in a position where you're comfortable with being the decision maker on firing somebody and executing on that, then that should be tell telltale number one that you don't yeah. want to manage. Yeah, absolutely. That was, that was interesting for me in the last uh, year there because we've had some pretty big decisions on who to let go and when and why and... Um, I had a big part in that of, of we notoriously hang on to people well past when we should mm -hmm. um, and don't have my department gets lots of performance improvement plans and, and things like that as needed but the other departments never really did and so there's been a lot of upsetting the apple cart and like so when you've had to let people go did you find they were surprised by it or had they had some clear expectations they knew they weren't performing at the very least even if they weren't on a plan they knew well yeah I wasn't performing I think um and I don't know this but I I think that they could see the writing on the wall because I was kind of coming th through like a force sure um <laughs> like I mean I I was I I Things were changing. I was slowly being given more and more responsibility, setting expectations, following up with people. Mm -hmm. um, and and what used to be okay there was very clearly no longer okay. Um, and it, we were making changes. I wanted to see changes. And we were make, I was having those be implemented at a higher clip than they've ever experienced. And... 
and some of these people just weren't open to the change. Um, and I think it was very evident that Amanda was making some some changes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and I, it, it, it was it was a tough time, um, but we always came out better for each one. Sure. Um, and 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 the other people as well. They were not happy. They weren't going to be happy with the changes we were going in the direction we were going, and they have all been much happier with that. They they were not shocked um, at all. Yeah, you know, I think that's where I was, where I had my job was a little easier in that previous company where I did have hiring and firing responsibilities. Is that expectations and metrics were clearly set, and the process was clearly set mm-hmm. before I even started with the company. It already existed. So when I moved into management, and I was still producing, so you know, a lead slash manager setting the expectations was easy because everyone got hired knowing here's what's expected of me i have to do this this and this every week if i hit 80 percent of that i'm cool if i drop below it for an average over three month over a quarter the, ne- the, the next quarter it's got to be at 100 percent. and if i don't hit it that quarter then you go on a 30-day performance plan it was set it was Super already thick, defined yeah. so then it was just a matter of managing it as we were going so you didn't get to the end of six months and go by the way uh two quarters ago you didn't hit your numbers and so last quarter you didn't either so this month you have to do this or you're fired we never got to that point so it made the process easier well you put it on them like that's that's the that's what i've learned with with all of this is um putting it on them of what are you going to do Mm -hmm. to fix this i i recently took um one of our developers out to um lunch basically we're building a our own proprietary platform it's actually really exciting and we're gonna go a hard left turn in what we're doing um in the in the tech stack that we're going to be using and he's very against it and (laughs) one of the you know what I'm well, I no, talking about. This it's I, just, but but it's change. It's change. It's change, change, and he's scared. He's scared. Yeah. They all, you know, in the past, all of, everyone was afraid of change at this company. They have all now since since I've kind of taken over things that they've adapted for the most part because now change is constant. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm constantly. We'll make a decision. We'll iterate. Um, I don't have all the answers, but we're going to learn and just kind of be nimble. We're small enough that we can be nimble. So let's be nimble. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went out to, to lunch with him and uh, talked about the fact that we were going to very potentially make this change. And he initially got very upset, as I expected. Um, and we kept talking. And and I put it back on him of, you know, y- I'm not going to make you learn this new language, this this programming language. You have the option to continue to use the language that you're using and support our current clients but as we move and migrate to this new one um we're going to have slowly have less and less work and essentially if you make that decision you are putting your own expiration date on your employment here and i straight i mean straight up said it and and he was you know he took it and he processed it and he actually came to the table very open and interested in, in discussing things, apologized for freaking out on me basically. And and we're now all on board. He's on board learning a new language that he feels that he is actually interested in because we went with his discussion and some others found you know something better. And it's all fine and good, but you have to be able to say those things. Sure. And but I put it on him of not like well if you don't do this I'm going to fire you it's you are making this choice and that's fine but this is what the end result's going to be yeah so right. I think the weirdest dynamic of what we're talking about <laughs> is how I have been in a situation a dozen or two times over the last three years that I had to look back at myself when I was in that situation as the employee 
and evaluate how I handled it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm the boss now looking at an employee going, this is a problem, whether it's a culture problem or a performance problem or both. And I need to do something about this. And if I have to, I'll fire this person based on it. And I've done that. Mm -hmm. But simultaneously, that has forced me to look back and go, oh, I clearly deserve to be fired. <laughs> right? Like, there, yeah, there are moments where like, like oh, yeah. whoops. You know, so like, so I, I didn't have enough empathy towards my superiors at the time to be able to understand. You don't have a perspective. I, especially I in your have 20s. It's well said. Especially in your 20s. Yeah. You just don't have that perspective. You don't have that experience. So like, I, I also think about that when I'm managing my 20 year olds of like, okay, let me give you some perspective because I know you don't have it. And so yeah. there, I, I give them a little bit of an olive branch of like, hey, you don't understand and I know you don't and you're not expected to. You're in your 20s. Like, let's, let me yeah. help bridge that for you. A Which is bit. hysterical though because if you were like me in your 20s, you didn't get it. <laughs> you probably weren't going to get it. And now I was just too stubborn. Like, yeah. I was too stubborn yeah. and I was too much of a know-it-all to understand it. Yeah. Um, and you so, can't help that. Like, no. This, but so, so, but, but if you can make the effort and then it, it's in their hands. But you feel like you're grown. When you, right? Like when you're in your 20s, like you feel like, like I'm an adult now. I have it figured out. Yeah. But you don't realize the context yeah. of like, oh, these other people around me have already gone through this and they've had to experience this maybe a decade or two or three longer than I have. Right. Um, and I just, you, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So if you're not able to make the move the way your employee did, which is collect himself, whether it's the same day, next day, whatever, and come back and have that discussion and be humble and take it. Yeah. Then you, <laughs> then you're great. deciding that you're either leaving or you're going to get fired and either way you're leaving. Yep. It's yeah. happening one way or another. Yeah. No, he was great. I, yeah, he was great. It ended up working out very well, but that is definitely not a statement that has ever been said to anyone there in the past. Yeah. I think the biggest growth curve for me as a manager was understanding, I, I knew inherently that I was no longer going to be the guy who was in the break room commiserating about how everything sucks or mm -hmm. the guy at the happy hour collectively bitching about management or the direction of the company or mm -hmm. whatever, because A, you're not gonna hear those things anymore because people won't talk to you about those around you anymore. Mm -hmm. right? And you have to understand that by default, you're now the point of the bitching. So you're now in the group of the people, that, uh, the, in the group of people that the rest of the rank and file employees are going to be complaining about. My crew's at happy hour right now. It's probably yeah, they're going on you right now. <laughs> They're God damn, about, Amanda! Yeah, so you have, let, let's say there's five of them. You have one or two of them. Oh, let's go with oh, six. There's like, no, there's like 15 people. Okay, there perfect. Right let's go 15. The math still works. You have a third, <laughs> you, have a, you have a third of those SOBs, and, and I mean that when daring. You, you, have a th you have a third of them right now epically bitching about everything that's happening. You got the other third, the other five are just hanging out, chilling, not really sure. Either they don't really have an opinion, they haven't formulated it yet, or they just want to stay neutral. And then you have the third that's like a little bit more gung-ho on your side or on the company's side, and that's the constant battle back and forth, and you just don't know. So all these people that are at the happy hour right now, did you ever used to, were you peers with them at one time, any of them? Uh, some of them, yes. Yeah. It makes me think of, you ever watch Friends back in the day? Yeah. When Chandler becomes a manager and that he experiences that. He goes from like where he's, hey, he's part yeah. of the team and then he becomes manager and no one's talking to him anymore because yeah. they're all talking about him. Yeah. Yeah. I will say I have a pretty good crew. They, um, they have not excluded me at all. We actually, the culture at eCreative is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Um I'm friends with a lot of the, the staff and like that comes down to compartmentalizing again. Yeah. And, and I've had that conversation with a few of them of like, Hey, there's times that I can be your girlfriend and then there's times I'm going to be your boss. And you have to think about that as well, um, of compartmentalizing. And if you can't, then we can't be friends. 
Um, so, and that's fine. Like if we can't do it, that if you can't compartmentalize, then then we'll just make that change and it's fine. But so, did you have a a favorite manager that you've kind of modeled your style after from your careers? You know, career past. Um. Or do you have your style, and your style is your style, and maybe coincidentally, it's like someone you used to really enjoy working for. But you know, yes, I will. I actually will give some props to uh, her name is Kristen Stebbins. Well done, Kristen. She, she is a State Farm agent in Saint Cloud, Minnesota, and she led by example. Like mm. that woman worked her ass off. She was encouraging. She. She was also my friend, yeah, and and so we were able to again compartmentalize that and and be able to to do that. Um, I found and I especially appreciated it how she managed after I had left and had been with less than stellar managers, and I actually had messaged her years later and was like, just so you know you're fantastic i really appreciate you and what you did for me and how you put your heart and soul into everything you do and i i, I wanted to tell her that because mm -hmm. i don't think people do that enough of like hey good job thank you or whatever mm -hmm. and i wanted her to know like she was really great and under a ton of stress you know it was a new agency at the time this was a decade ago um but no, she's she was fantastic, and so I think to some degree uh, modeling after her, and then the other degree is just I I am who I am, and uh, you have your stuff. I right? am my I I can't be anything other than who I am. I have learned to um, be a little bit more careful with my words, but yeah. overall, I'm just intense and a force, <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. and it's okay. And they've all adapted to me, you know, and. And so it's worked out well, um, but yeah, they've adapted to me more than yeah. I to them. What do, you, what do you think yours is? My what? Just kind of style. Uh, well, if I had to sum it up in a word, I'd probably say folksy. You know, folksy. Folksy. I'm from northern Minnesota, and I'm kind of a just kind of a folksy get along guy. And um, so, for example, fire. You know, firing people. Mm -hmm. um, different styles I, I would watch peers of mine with their style that was like a 15 minute conversation that finally led up to the <coughs> and I just couldn't do that because if I knew we're having this meeting and the purpose is I'm cutting you loose that's the purpose of the meeting you don't know it yet it was I would spit it out right away yeah and I mean right away so, well, it's the first thing you should say. Have a seat. Right. So this is what I would do. <laughs> we'd, we'd, we'd sit down, and a lot of times, in, in, in our case, these were regular weekly one-on-ones. So there was no, oops, I'm getting called to the principal's office. Sure. And the, I always did the same thing. I said, I would sit down and say, well, Amanda, we're, we're, we're cutting you loose today. And then... Shit, for, you didn't know you were getting fired coming here, <laughs> did you? All right, go ahead. But that was it. We're, you know... We're, we're we're gonna we're cutting you loose today, or we're you know we we need to, whatever I said, but it was the first words out of my mouth, and then I could just be myself. Breathe. Because yeah. Because otherwise, because well, of my folksy kind of nature, I'd be like I, I would have probably stammered. I'm, I, and now and you would have been too, obvious. You would have been too friendly. Right. And yeah. I and I would have been the manager where the person getting fired would have figured it out and probably would have went Chad just. Say it. Just say it. You know, say I had one of those uh, about a year ago uh, where I had scheduled meetings at the end of the day and I was firing two different people and I had them in the conference room and I fired somebody and then the second guy came in before he even closed the door, the fray, he just goes, so am I fired too? And I just said, yep. yes, <laughs> like, yeah, yes, you Thank are. Thank you for making this easy. Yes, you are. So what's weird about firing for me is that it, I don't know if this trend is going to continue and maybe you guys have an input on this. I have noticed for, as a general rule, what I think they're going to do mm -hmm. is the opposite of their demeanor. 
So if this is a loud, aggressive type of person, which is me in general, um, when, when I have fired people in that, with that type of personality, they're very quiet, very reserved, few words, it's over quickly. But the quiet ones yeah. are the ones that have gotten combative. And that's, that surprised me at the beginning. I didn't expect that. And I don't know if that's because they really have all the thoughts that every other human has, but they're used to holding them back and now it doesn't matter. Mm. But I had one where I let the guy go and it was an argument. And eventually, you know, I don't know, three, four minutes into the argument, which doesn't sound like very long, but it can't, it's, it feels yeah, like it. It feels like forever. Um, yeah. I'm like, what, uh, I, what else do you want me to say? Like, you're not going to convince me to not fire you. Like, right. this is happening. The so decision has been the made. The decision's been made. I'm great with debating this if you want. Like, I'll give you my opinion. Yeah. Right? I'm not going to hold back. But but if if you think you're going to win your job back, that's a different... That, that, that's not happening. But, and why would you want to at that point? Right. That's, you know... I, th- I, th- I agree. And I think it gives a quiet, reserved person the luxury and platform to say it doesn't matter anymore i can say my true feelings and then i think for the outgoing norma- normally boisterous person it's such a humbling experience that yeah. you're not comfortable being outgoing and talkative anymore and you just want to get the hell out of that you situation. do you want to as soon as you can you want to yeah, leave like yeah. can yeah. everyone just not remember the you? remember the one employee that i fired i think you were here you were fairly new and and he hung out for about 45 minutes what? Yes. 45 minutes doing what like talking packing up his desk like <laughs> almost like almost like it didn't bother him right he'd pack a little talk he'd pack a little. a little talk a little yes he did you're right yeah. so you know that 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 was strange so now i i've now like and, and thankfully i don't have anybody on the radar at the present moment so it's not a present concern yeah but nonetheless, like I kind of, I, <laughs> I, I kind of go into those discussions expecting them to react the opposite to who they are. I've only been fired one time, and that time was exactly what I just described. You were I, quiet. I was very quiet, and I was asked if I had anything to say, and I said no. And I just, said, like, what? I just said, "Can I pack up my shit now?" And it was like, "Yeah, yeah." So, um, yeah, you're right. Cause what, what are, you know, what can be said at that point? It's right. done. You've made the decision in that circumstance. There was multiple higher ups involved and those people have obviously signed off on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. I was still surprised by it just because of my tenure and, mm-hmm. and success there. Um, but I, I look back on that experience and say, I should have known um, I should have left earlier. We had outgrown each other, et cetera, et cetera. Have either of you ever terminated someone that you then ultimately regretted? Maybe not at the time, but a month later, six months later, as the company grew and you realized maybe I jumped the, jumped the gun or pulled the trigger too quick? No? No, not for me. I have a half a one just based on, I think, the person that was let go because of primarily lack of culture fit. But I utilized a small stint of lack of performance as my justification. And I just don't think I handled it the way I should have. Sure. Um, so I have a little bit of regret, but not like bring them back regret. I had an old colleague that I connected with recently that we used to work at the same company that I got fired from. He too got fired. His, um, uh, not predecessor, it's, it's successor. Success. His successor in his role with clients it took over the business very very well and then ultimately moved into a new job about four or five years later and this old employee who got fired had such a great relationship with the old client that my old employer sat down with him about the idea of bringing him back so i got to hear this second hand which is really interesting because I've never been in a situation where I've been fired and now X number of years later, I have that same employer, not the same employer, the same person, mm-hmm. the same employer uh, talking about bringing me back. And ultimately he did not. 
I think there's just mm, I don't know, I don't know what the number is, but what would you say? Ninety five percent chance that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The culture changes. The company changes. He or she who left years ago has a mental projection of what the company is and that's frozen in time from four or five years ago. So are you going to be able to come back in and actually catch up to speed? I would, I would presume that's not going to work as I a general. Know. I don't know. I, I, I've just never been in a situation where we've let, I've let someone go that we would want back. So like I have no, yeah. I just don't have any... Yeah. context for that the culture thing and you brought it up earlier is really really interesting because the culture component is a very interesting way to have to manage people because the only reason why you're talking about an individual and how they are affecting the culture is if you've already had at least two or three negative culture experiences because of a particular person um And normally if somebody gets let go for culture reasons, almost always they're performing well, like in their job. Yep. So on a day to day, they're very, very good, but they're combative or they fight with people or negative or negative negativity. Yeah. So did you find it was hard? You have you cut loose people like that? Not for culture. I have, I have a handful of people currently who are borderline not fitting in the culture. So I'd be interested in both of you, your thoughts on that, that because you two have been in management type roles for more, you know, longer than I have. I think this happens a lot in staffing where the big producer with the shitty attitude gets a lot more rope. And I think it affects the culture of the particular office. That's what I've seen. Yeah. What What's your thoughts on that my thought honestly is you cut them loose Mm. you cannot you cannot set the precedent that that's fine no matter what you're producing for the company because if that person affects three of my other employees i've now lost Mm -hmm. maybe i'm going to have three resignations or lower productivity from three other employees that supersedes what that one person is doing and i Culture is so huge. We spend so much time at work um, that that's been a really big piece for me with hiring um, that I would I would have to let them go. Um, and that's where, you know, I'm kind of watching some of these people of how many of my employees are you affecting? Are you the cancer that is sitting in my department? Mm-hmm. Because my department's performing at top notch and if I keep you how much are you going to infect because that's not going to be okay with me sure um so I I don't I don't care I, I don't care well, you- I, I think okay let's let's we're a bigger small like we I have bigger departments so sure like, if you have six people, you know, right, like it's but, a little but, different. But, oh, of course, but we all have different experiences and here is a little bit different than where I used to be. But um, I think the high producer could and should earn more flexibility than other people. We've talked a lot about this, mm-hmm. like an sure. earn the right type dynamic, whether that be uh, work remote flexibility. Sure. Um, maybe there is a understanding that they won't be judged in the same capacity on things like documentation or, or some ancillary topic that, that may or may not be a big deal for some of your more junior employees. Maybe they're given more rope in regards to how often one-on-one meetings are happening. I think those types of things for true high producers are very productive. I um, would agree with that. But the, the culture component um, is... It, 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 it's this weird, fluid, movable, how do you really describe it type dynamic. And as the immediate line manager, you just know when someone's fucking with that. And then you're ultimately going to have to make a decision. And I don't think um, 
middle managers or executive level managers can be the one to make that call. I feel like that if you're, if someone's going to get fired because of a culture dynamic, that needs to be spearheaded by the immediate manager of the person involved. Because if you're not in the office or in that department or in that region or whatever you want to call it on a daily basis, the only thing you can go on is what your manager below you is telling you. So you as a mid-level or executive level manager could give an opinion like, hey, based on the track record of what we're talking about, it sounds like this is a cultural related problem, but you're only gonna get there if the direct supervisor like sees this as a problem, perceives it as a problem, hears it from other people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think the culture component is really limited to like the true line level manager. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, um, I think if you're smart, you ignore the revenue and fire the culture problem, mm -hmm. regardless of the pain that comes with that. Yeah. And I think not many companies have, um, figured out how to do that. Yeah. Um, you have to presume that the business is the Titanic. So we're not turning this sucker for one person. We're just not. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to let this person go and handle taking on some water if we're going to be able to survive this. Otherwise, culture more though than per more so than performance can turn into a true iceberg if we keep the Titanic It can, thing and going. that's what, kind of what I was saying yeah. is mm -hmm. it becomes then now something that, you know, if they're if it's attitude, which is is typically what I'm seeing is is attitude. Right issues that's infectious mm -hmm. um and when i was managing the team and not the other departments the attitude of the department was fantastic and if i were to catch someone gossiping or being negative that shit was nipped in the bud so fast and i was like unacceptable fix it or go like i'm not tolerating it mm -hmm. and I have a, a manager now who isn't as direct as I am. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so, so working with him on that, but it's, it's one of those things where I, I just wouldn't tolerate it. And so now I'm, I must, I'm level two above that and I'm not as involved. And I'm right. starting to hear whispers of problems and people coming to my office we had this disagreement and we had this in it. it <laughs> this was the end of last week where I was like, why is everything a dumpster fire every time I take one step away from a department? Like, I can't manage 38 people. Right. I, I cannot do it. So I have to either have the right people managing the departments or find someone else. Yeah. yeah. Because I cannot do it. All right, let's flip it. How do you hire for culture? That's all I've done is hire for culture. Okay, so explain what you <laughs> like for you. How how do you know they're a fit? Do you, who do you involve? So mm. I don't hire with experience. Uh, I look for the kind of person. Okay, so we basically. Um, have adopted a policy of uh, hiring with no experience and they start at the bottom and we promote from within. And I basically try to find my type A personality, who has the it factor, who, you know, you always hear managers, high, you, you like people like you, you know? And so I try to find similar qualities of are they confident, like truly actually relaxed and confident in this interview? Anyone we've hired who seemed very nervous, like just like a shaky chihuahua, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. it never works out. Um, but if you can come in there and you can shake my hand and you can confidently talk and you don't have to have all the answers. You can be like, I have no experience in that arena, but I would love to learn more. Perfect. That's a way better answer than a bullshit answer. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for just that that it factor 
I do not care if you know one thing about digital marketing. I don't care if you know what a website is. I, I don't care. I can teach you that. I cannot teach you to care for your clients. I cannot teach you how to have charisma. I cannot teach you drive. You have to have that from within. And so those are the pieces that I kind of look for. Mm -hmm. What have they done in their in their past that shows that drive? Were they involved in a lot of things? Were, did they hold leadership roles in college? Did the, you know how many things were they involved in? Um, have they created their own website? Have they been marketing themselves? You know, those are the things that I kind of look for, those ancillary things that, you know, I don't need you to have worked in, in an agency before. I don't need you to know any of that stuff. I can teach you all that. Yeah. Um, but I can't teach you it, the yeah. it factor. Uh, and so that's, that's, it's hard. There are times you, you miss the mark. You make mistakes. You make yeah. mistakes. Uh, but I will tell you uh, in the last year of my aggressive hiring and I've been hiring for this company for about three years it's it's been fantastic uh we do a ton of training these people become experts in what they do but they have to have that extra bit uh they have to prove that to me and so yeah that's that's my way okay. of doing it I, yeah. I don't I don't like hiring people with experience. Yeah, and I am the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Something we're opposite on. Exact okay. opposite. So <clears throat> our industry, the staffing business, as a general rule, the bigger players have done exactly what you're describing. And they hire college kids right out of college. It's can, can you tell stories about how you were competitive in your freaking frat? Like, what was it like playing sports in college? Like, how are you motivated? Like, because we're in a salesy environment, right? Yeah. So all of my hiring experience in my former life was exactly what you're describing. And we're just looking for the it factor and you either have it or you don't. We had one out of 50 that we would interview and not convey that effectively. And the one out of 50 would come back and like fight for it and be like, I, I want this, give me another shot, let me meet somebody else, like, you know, but normally the 49 out of 50 that didn't get it would just float away. And then we were okay with that. Mm -hmm. I have built this organization on a completely different stance, which is like, I won't even talk to you unless you have experience in this industry. Then I'm looking for that connection on a personal level. So once we've established that you know what's up in the industry, you're going to get in here and we're either going to be able to like commiserate on some of the downfalls of the industry and you're going to get that we're trying to do something different or you won't. Once you've passed that test, then it's basically a gut call on my end. But what's interesting about this is that we've developed a culture recently and you can obviously talk to this better than I could because you're more directly involved in it, Chad, is that some of my employees are coming up to me going, we really want to be involved in the next hiring decisions because we want to make sure this person's going to fit, which on one level is a super huge compliment to me because I'm the one who hired all the people that are saying our culture is awesome. Yeah. But at the same time, it makes me laugh because they're questioning my ability to hire <laughs> people that are going to fit within our culture. But I'm the one that hired all of you guys in the first place. But I'm like, absolutely. Let's do this. Let's figure out a way to be able to get you involved in the hiring process, probably at the end. Yeah. Yeah, you weed them out. Yeah. Just, just at the end to be to be able to say like, all right, you know, what do we need to do? Is it a happy hour? Do we invite them to come in and play pool and hang out for a little bit? Like, what are we gonna do exactly? Um, but we're an eclectic group of people. We got young, we got old, we got some people that are super military focused and very like linear and organized and have this that mentality we have others that are quite a bit more social and random mm -hmm. um you know so it's funny how it works but like yeah. what's your opinion on culture in general and or like if we were going to hire somebody how would we make the right culture decision well i i i have experience hiring as a group and what we would do is everyone had a certain responsibility in the hiring process 
So someone, it might be Amanda's job to ask the corny, tell me about a time when question. <laughs> but then we, <laughs> oh, so, you, so you check those boxes. <laughs> but then I was usually that culture guy. So then there was, you know, someone might do the, tell, the just going through the resume. Tell me about this role. Tell me about this role. And then I might be the one to, because of my folksy schmoozy nature that would just <laughs> sort of converse with them. I was usually what what I would do with resumes. What a great word, right? Well, I would you know I would research resumes and see oh they went to whatever UMD. Okay, I went to UMD, or they're from somewhere in northern Minnesota. I'm from somewhere. I would find common connections so I could. Um, uh, get them to relax a little bit and open up so we could just be talking as people. But the point is, everyone had a different role, so it wasn't all four of us having the same kind of interview. So we weren't all asking them. Tell They're me all looking it. for different things. Was right. it a group panel, by the way? Nope, it was individual. Oh, it was individual. Yep. So okay, someone would come in. We've done panels. There'd be an initial basic interview, and the final interview was usually, you know, a couple hours where it was like 20 to 30 minutes with four of us. And... That's how I might envision someday if others in the group are involved in the hiring process. Obviously, it's important to determine who has the D. Whose decision is it? Well, here, obviously, it's yours. Um, I cannot so hear the phrase, who has the D, <laughs> <laughs> without, without my mind. <laughs> but I'm happy you said the word decision because... Yeah. My mind starts ran- – but I, I like what yeah. you're thinking because I too – in so I'm a little bit more comfortable having the different roles in a panel setting. Sure. But if I was going to start involving you guys, which I have zero issues doing, I don't want to be in the room. Like right. I want you to be able to have a discussion without me clouding Yeah, anything. I don't – I'm not a big fan in our industry anyways of panel interviews. I just think that people get too – robotic and nervous and you know they're in front of four people i'm not necessarily against it but i think in your this scenario if uh, everyone has a different um uh, job to do in the interview process and then i give you my input someone else input input and ultimately it's your decision based on everyone's input i think the problem you run into is if everyone if you're involving the whole group and everyone has too much input, you know, now you start sliding down to where it becomes, what are we starting this, you know, some private club that... And the likelihood of everybody agreeing at the same time is low. Yeah. So, now I forgot. Your thoughts on panel interviews. Yeah, yeah. so, so well thank you well for that. Yeah. So the whole point, I feel, of, of, especially if you're looking for someone with an it factor, the whole point of this interviewing process is... I'm going to put you in some uncomfortable situations and see how you react. I don't want you, I don't want you if you're going to crumble talking to four people. Like you're going to have sales calls and you're going to have digital marketing calls and you're going to have whatever at my company where you could have four very loud opinionated higher ups, the owner, you know, these different executives. Can you hold your own? Yeah. Can you hold your own and say, no, I know what I'm talking about. I'm going to advise you. You know your business. I know this. Can you do that? If you can't handle a a relaxed interview with four people on a panel, because we're all pretty relaxed, yeah, you're you're not right for me anyway. Sure. Interesting point. Um, Because you have to make them uncomfortable. How How do they react to it? I mean, it's the same thing when I'll have someone show up for an interview and everyone's like, your interview's here. Hurt, you're late. And I was like... Make them wait. No, they're good. Yeah. Like, make them wait. Mm -hmm. I want to see what they do. Are they going to converse with someone sitting in the lobby? Are they going to nervously be on their phone? Are they twitching and doing stuff? Like, I want to see what they do. Yeah. I want to apply a little pressure. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Not horrible, but like, Yeah. all right, you're nervous. Guess what? You're going to have sales calls. You're going to be sitting in a lobby waiting for the president sometime or whoever, some executive to have this, this call. Can you can you handle the heat? Yeah. And if you can't, this is not right for you. And and I'm not going to even waste either of our time. Well, that's a really interesting thing because I don't I don't do that. I don't put on a lot of pressure situations in an interview setting. However, I'm more likely to put on pressure when you work for me. 
So on a day-to-day basis, there are going to be times like you've seen my style when we, when we run our morning meetings. I'm very open. I'm making jokes. I tell a lot of personal stories. I want us to be able to be comfortable in front of each other, business related and personal related. I want us to get to know each other. But at the same time, I'm going to all of a sudden make it weird and awkward out of nowhere in a meeting. <laughs> and it's going to be like, oh, all right, we, we are <laughs> like, all right, cool. I'm really happy that you're excited for the Super Bowl. But can we talk about blankety blank? Because we are sucking at this right now and we need to fix this. Yeah. And I do that personally by relationship building. I think the relationship building component with individual employees is the most undervalued component of management. Agreed. The yeah. only way that I've found to be able to do that is having meetings one-on-one every single week. <clears throat> I have everybody in here almost every week barring some random snowstorm or something that goes down. But like, you know, people are in here And I'm going to broach topics that make sense because sometimes you need me to kick you in the ass. Sometimes you need a hug. Sometimes I need to figure out exactly what you're struggling with. Sometimes we're not talking about work at all and we need to talk about your personal life. Or sometimes I'm just going to open the floor and let you decide. I have some employees that won't talk about their personal life at all. And I have to intentionally, without being weird and, 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 and like intrusive, Try and get them to open up a little bit. You Mm -hmm. know, like, help me understand what your life is like outside of these four walls. Give me some perspective. Yeah, why do you show up? Why are you motivated? How do you feel about the fact that things aren't going your way? How do you feel about the fact that things are going your way right now? Are you more likely to take your foot off the gas? Or is that motivating to continue to go more? And those every week meetings for me are kind of my secret little sauce yeah. Where like when it comes to what you described earlier, Chad, in regards to having an established hiring or managerial uh, criteria, right? Like that is going to be my criteria, right? Like how do you manage the people below you? And I will personally shadow those meetings with you at the beginning to make sure that we're on the same page about how I want you to run these And then moving forward, I need you to start doing this. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to lead you, Mr. or Miss Manager underneath me, to be able to articulate back to me what's going on with these employees. Because the bigger we get, to your point earlier, Amanda, the, the bigger we get, the more layers of management there are, the more I'm not going to be personally involved with the discussion with Susie Q about what's going on and why she's struggling. So if you and I, Chad, don't have a good rapport about what I need you to figure out in those meetings and how I need you to spit that back to me, then I can't help you do whatever the hell it is you need to do. Yeah. And yeah. then if you come to me and say, you think this person needs to be fired, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, yeah, I haven't heard anything. About you that. meet yeah. with this person every week and you and I meet every week and then all of a sudden you want to fire this person and we haven't talked about it? Like, what are you yeah, talking about? Like, where okay. did this come from? Um, and I just, I just noticed as a general rule in my old organization that we were really, 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 really good about focusing on this as a weekly activity with our external clients, but we didn't do it worse shit internally. So like we had this weird strength of managing our customers intimately and this weird deficiency on managing our individual internal employees, which was strange. At one, so, point, at one point when I was started managing people, um, a mentor of mine, who didn't work for the company he was he was just a personal mentor and high level businessman um you should say it you got to say the phrase my uncle mick my uncle mick. my uncle mick <laughs> yeah. yes continue yeah. rosen was i only know this shit because of our know, weekly yeah. meetings yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> rosen was rosen was talking about uncle mick today uh, Ro- Ro- rosie was really yeah, he was. okay all right he, he was talking about how when mick went to uh um, cbs and left clear channel uh, at one point, Mick wanted to bring Rosie over to the good neighbor to CCO. Yeah. And Rosie said, well, you're going to have to pay my non-compete. I have a six-month non-compete if I leave KFAT. 
And Mick's like, well, I'm not going to pay that. And Rosie goes, well, you're the one I was working for when I signed it in the first place. <laughs> right, so you know, we need to figure out a way so to Mick work was around this. at K-Fan when he signed the, the deal at K-Fan anyways. But, but with Mick... <laughs> When I would have issues, I would, uh, and I'd ask him things, he'd say, you know, I, I would talk about someone I was having an issue with. And Mick would say, well, what do you know about him or her? And I'd go into, well, they're at 3.5 meetings <laughs> a week, and I'd get into all these statistics. <laughs> get into statistics. your nitty-gritty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, he'd be, yeah and he'd be like, no, 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 no. What do you mean? Married? Do they have kids? Do they play softball? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, he was the first person that started opening my eyes to you know, there's the business business piece, but you know, you got to get to know these people, and it, gets, the people it speaks business. to your relationship. Yeah, they're humans. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, we talked about this before the show, but like, I mean, le- le- legitimately, people are just living their lives, and like it or not, we spend more time with each other than we do with our significant others and our kids. Yeah. Um, and if you. Well, A, like when something's when something's going on in any area of your life, unless you have some special talent that I haven't personally figured out, it is impacting every other. Mm-hmm. So if you're going through a divorce or you're struggling financially or an illness or a death in the family or pick any other thing that you can immediately think of, I don't care how hard you try, that's going to impact your ability to do your job. Maybe for 10 minutes, maybe for an hour, maybe for a week, maybe for a freaking year. And if you don't have that rapport with your employees to be able to A, know that, and B, support them in that, Mm -hmm. then how can you be helpful? You were talking about this morning, and if you wanna share, great, I'll just share the generic because you don't have to share. Like, when a death in the family happens and you work for a bigger organization, the only thing they really give a shit about is their attendance policy. Right, yeah. So like, did you or did you not miss too many days in a row and how are we going to handle this right Mm -hmm. and that just shows a level of in person it's just impersonal and if you're a big enough company where you have that policy cool nothing wrong with it that's what you feel is best for the business but still your line level manager if they have some type of relationship with you they're going to be willing to fight for you or or help you or give you the freedom or i don't know well it's short-sighted to not be flexible because no matter what, so what, if you can really get to know your empl- employees and build that rapport and be flexible with the fact that life freaking happens, mm-hmm. um, they're going to have more loyalty. And then when your life as a manager gets topsy turvy, they're going to be a lot more understanding as well. Yeah. And and I think it's just so short sighted to be like, well, this is our policy. You get a day or whatever. Or yeah. it, like, no, I was thinking. So that, what happened was my my wife's mother, so my mother in law, uh, has had dementia, and so she died yesterday. So Lori's been up in northern Minnesota in the care facility all day Saturday. All day Sunday, she's in hospice. Mm-hmm. Comes home late Sunday night, just to sh- <clears throat> shower and grab some clothes. Leaves six a.m. Monday morning. Stays all mon- Monday night, and she died yesterday afternoon. So Lori had missed two days in a row. So she comes home last night. So Barb passes away at three thirty. She comes home. So we finally go to bed, and Lori is exhausted. I mean, you yeah. remember? I mean, she's literally there with her mother for four days waiting for you know she doesn't want to go to sleep and have her yeah she's there for a reason she doesn't want her mom to pass away when she's up sleeping in the lobby so yeah. she's there so she's exhausted so she goes to bed and i had been taught trying to get her to just would you just call in i can't because where she works which is a very large healthcare organization if i miss three days in a row i mean even if you call in legitimately sick with a cold if you miss three days in a row the third day you got to call some fancy name for some other part of HR and you have to get in this case she would have had to get something from the hospice nurse fax down you know and Lori just didn't want to deal with that so she got up this morning and went to work and so I you know I brought her to work and I went to lunch with her and imagine she's like you know usually what happens when someone dies you get into funeral mode and you take your bereavement uh her mom will be having a 
service a week or two down the road. Mm -hmm. So it was just strange to me that I'm lying in bed going, yeah, this is fucked up. You know, I mean, if it was me, I'd be like, Jeremy, I'll... Yeah, you you send me a text and go, here's what's up. I I was waiting for you to text me. Right. Now, she's my mother-in-law, so for me to get up and come to work, no big deal. Well, sure. But there's pros and cons to small... That's that's the thing, again, not so much management, but just as as a employee basically out there mm-hmm. of like pros and there are pros and cons to small, medium and large companies. And so I would find this being this situation, a very strong pro of, I know I can text my employer that my life has, you know, yeah, shit the bed. <laughs> yeah. I need to, I need another day or yeah. I'm going to work remote today or I'm going to be in late yeah. or whatever. And it's a text or an email or a call. It's not a form. It's not a, like, yeah. you know, bureaucracy bullshit. Like yeah. it's, right. and, and I'm the type where if he would have texted me and said, I'm going to work from home, I'd be like, Chad, can we just agree to not <laughs> bullshit each other? And why don't You're you not just, working. Just why don't you just working. take yeah. the day? Just take the yeah. day. Um, you know, so. Now with that said, she was, I mean, I want to just close the loop there. Lori wasn't bitter about it because pros and cons. Oh, right? fair, she, she fair, fair, fair. She understands who she's working for. And yep. That comes with the territory. So yep. she gets it. You know. Well, there's pros to big companies too. Sure. So you have more, you know, Advancement opportunities. N- name recognition yeah. on resumes, yeah. the whole thing. You have, yeah, 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 yeah. probably higher pay. But, I mean, there's different, there are benefits. Yeah. You have to decide as an individual what's important to you. Sure. Um, so that's all. You know, I, I tell that to people I'm hiring. I'm like, there's not a big ladder here. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> there aren't that many rungs. Yeah. So yeah. if you're looking to climb the corporate ladder, this is not the place yeah. for you. Like a stool. Yeah, like <laughs> congratulations. Yeah. That's the step. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we talked about this at the very very beginning and we didn't really dive into it deep, but it's kind of related to this topic where um well, I've always viewed the types of managers and whether we talk about day-to-day performance or a bereavement situation and I think it's kind of interchangeable. Of, I've always thought there was two different types. There's the players coach, and you kind of alluded to it earlier with your State Farm gal, mm-hmm. where you said the phrase like she was outworking everybody and always involved. I think back to being 16 years old in the restaurant business, and I'm a cook, right? I make freaking eleven dollars an hour or whatever I was making, and one of the front of the house managers, I'll never forget him. Uh, his name was Eric Hammer, and of course we called him Hammer, and he nobody outworked that guy. He would let you as a server leave early and close your shift or close your section if he needed to. Like he was he outworked you, he outcared, and everybody loved him because he was so committed and so focused. Then equally an equal level of respect to him. One of my first bosses in the staffing business was more of the distant fatherly figure. And fatherly just because he was a guy. Maybe we can interchange mother. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. Parental. But like parental, perfect. Well done, non-sexual. Well, well, well. That's why you did the Correct. Well done. So he was a parental. He was a parental figure. So, but he was substantially more distant. Yeah. Um, where like I was more worried about him thinking well of me than it was like whether or not I I didn't know what he was doing when I walked into his office I felt like I was bothering him (laughs) right like and the way he ran meetings was very authoritative and you didn't question it was just like he's the boss and that's it very, very, very different styles, and I equally respect both of them yeah. because of that. I used to think, personally, that you had to be one or the other. And I learned the area of error of my ways that I think the right managerial style is knowing when to play each one of those two cards. And yes. when to be the guy or the gal who can br- bring somebody into the office and have some of those awkward, weird conversations and be like, 
I'm going to intentionally ruin part of our friendship right now. Yeah. Intentionally, on purpose. I'm going to make you feel very uncomfortable and I'm going to challenge you. I might even threaten your job based on the situation and I'm going to be okay with that because in the moment, the distant parental figure card is the right card. And then maybe the next day, the next week, the next, the next month, it's more of the player's coach mentality. I haven't found many managers that have figured out brilliantly how to be able to balance the two. That is my ultimate goal as to, as to like, if I, if, if I were to ever get what you described state farm girl as like, Kristen. I, like I want Kristen, 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 God love you, Kristen. <laughs> if if it, it like, I would love to receive those compliments someday. And I think the only way I'm going to receive those compliments is if I can effectively pull off what I just described mm-hmm. where they can feel comfortable in the right moment to come in and tell me like my dog just died and I don't know what to do. And like, it's, it's 10 o'clock in the morning and like, you, you're not a dog person, Jeremy, but like I'm struggling mm-hmm. and, but they can feel comfortable talking to me about that. And then maybe I just give them the day or whatever the situation calls for. And then if they're fucking up their job, that I will be the same person that calls them out and says, like you said earlier, if you, um, okay, you have to say this. What was the phrase that you put? You are putting an expiration date on your own employment, which I love. <laughs> so how do you guys feel about like the different demeanor dynamic of like different bosses you've had and then how that kind of rubs off on a, what you want your boss to be like or what type of boss you want to be? Well, I would say the best managers or bosses I've ever worked for did have, I'm going to use the term, a chameleon-like nature to them, where on the one hand they could be very relatable to me, but then Sally over here, who was opposite of me, they also were very relatable to Sally. So the person had did have that ability to you know, bob and weave and change depending on the person. Does it make sense? Yeah. It does. It does. You, ha- I agree completely. Because if you want to be, uh, you know, my boss is, you know, whatever, the, the big jock, <laughs> he's going to relate to this, but not to this, this, and this. And so I can think of the couple people in mind that were my favorite managers in the past growing, you know, over the last 25 years, and they tended to be, people that could that were uh, flexible and yeah chameleon like i guess in terms of their management style how about you i i think that management is a lot like sales i think everything's a lot like sales um in sales you have to to match your person right and how they talk and the speed the demeanor like there's these techniques i think in management it's the same of i need to understand who is in front of me at all times Mm -hmm. Um, I need to make sure I'm available. I need to match them if they're really sad or they're excited or whatever they are. I need to be excited with them or, you know, commiserate or whatever it is. The, the hiccup that I have found recently is being stretched so thin sure. that I don't get to be the chameleon. I am the, I don't have time. Yeah. I don't have time for you. And that's a shit. That's a yeah. really shit spot to be in because I actually care. Yeah. Um. I want to spend time with them and do my rounds and talk to everyone. And and my my mentality is how how can I make your job better? That's my all I want to do every day. Mm-hmm. And I don't have time for that. And yeah. so, but I think the chameleon. It's a great way to put it. I mean, you have to adjust your style with everyone, and if you can't be both ends of the spectrum you're gonna kind of isolate and or ostracize mm-hmm. a, a large portion of portion. people yeah I, I would agree with that yeah um i i'm trying intentionally to learn how to be more chameleon like i feel like i think the right way and i act and i'm acting the right way but i've also made enough mistakes in regards to um well, I'll word it this way. What you just said spawned the idea in my head of knowing that I've made mistakes in regards to how I've communicated to people. Um, 
I, I think one of my weaknesses as a manager is that historically I have viewed myself as a speak the truth, be brutally honest, even if it's not popular. And because of that, I've put myself in spots where I've overshared. And I think that was a good mentality as a employee and as a coworker. Um, but then it kind of bit me in the ass as a manager. And then I realized like, oh, there are certain moments where I have to mirror the person in front of me, which is basically what you were saying before, Amanda, where um, you know, I, can be a, I can be a loud, aggressive type person and sometimes you're sitting next to a quiet, retiring individual and then that can change the dynamic and you can scare them and then therefore they don't feel comfortable with you anymore. Or I've gone down the road where there was a moment that I needed to be a little bit more distant and disciplinarian or parental or whatever word fits and that I went into player's coach mode and I overshared or told too personal of a story or overshared mistakes that I've made or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and then I felt like I was losing the balance of the fact that I'm their boss. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I've really had that like bite me. I haven't had somebody quit or anything because I said something inappropriate or yeah. I haven't had somebody quit because they perceive me as being a jerk or something like, like I don't think I've done something egregious to where I've lost employees yet, we'll say. <laughs> um, but for me personally, just the way my style is, I'm more likely to get very personal and very deep early in order to be able to like set some type of rapport. But there needs to be moments where I'm not sharing certain things or I'm not going to tell you exactly what we're doing mm -hmm. or I'm Which like, can be hard. It's very hard. Yeah. Right. Like I'm so open. Right. I'm so open. Right. So like Chad, you and I have an amazing relationship and I love it. You love it. Like we've talked about this a thousand times and we both appreciate it, you know, but technically at the present moment, you are not running this office. Right. So there are times where I need to be careful and be like, okay, I'm not going to share this about another person. I'm not going to tell you that this person, or maybe I shouldn't tell you that this person's on my radar for some reason, but I run the risk with you. I do regularly because I just think like, A, I want your input and B, I appreciate what you are in this office. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not careful, I could either do that to you at the wrong time and make you think something different about one of your coworkers. Um, or maybe, you know, sometime down the road, I'm just doing that with the wrong individual. Yeah. Right. And you yeah. just, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of our core competency, excuse me, one of our core competencies, and we only have two of them is what I call intense transparency. So I am more likely to err on the side of telling you a little bit more than a little bit less. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that comes from working for enough companies that keep too much shit quiet. Yeah. And therefore I'm just swinging the pendulum too far to the other direction. Not really sure. Um, but I'm just going to continue to debate that. And I'm sure if we had this exact show in three years from now, like we would be laughing about some of the things we're saying <laughs> or whatever, sure. but like, but that's oh, part, totally. that's but it, part, but that's of, the part of the thing, right? It's part of the yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. like, you know, no, nobody exactly knows what they're doing and you're making the best decision you can with the information in hand and you have, you have prejudices, you have preconceived notions, you have judgments of people based on how they like wronged you or, or whatever. And those are things that are tough to overcome. You know, um, one employee, like our hottest employee right now who is closing shit left and right is, is the guy that was on the chopping block not long ago. Mm -hmm. Right. And thank God I had the foresight to be able to be like, okay, how are we going to handle this? You and I talked about it. I processed it and I'm like, okay, I think I know what this person needs and he needs more time. And if I give him more time, we're going to see what's happening. Poof. Yeah. Now he's on fire. Yeah. You're right. So, I mean, but it, that's, that's the trick, the trick of finding what is it? Does he need a kick in the ass? Does he need training? 
Does what? What is it? Does he need because patience? Because if you can find that puzzle piece and you can figure that out, then it's on them. Mm -hmm. Like to because you know, especially if it's training. If you can figure out, okay, it's simply a lack of training, or I know that they need me to whatever meet with them every morning or whatever. You can do so much as a manager. And that's it. And at the end of the day, though, then then it's on them. Yeah. Like, you can't... Management isn't fixing everything. It's trying to figure out what do they need to be their best self, best employee. So... I think you would... I would hope in three, four, five years if we listen back on these... Do we laugh? We should laugh. I think yeah. laughing, Well, you should. You should. If we're learned. laughing, I think that's a good sign. If we're like, well, look, we obviously had it all figured out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. That would be a problem. Right? Yeah. So hopefully we will get a good chuckle over it. Yeah. Well, I mean. And it's... I'll get used to the sound of my voice. Oh, Ma you maybe like never. No. no, you're not used to it yet either, are you? I yeah. hate, you know, I'm, st I'm still in that phase of hard to listen to yourself. Okay. Jeremy, on the other hand. Oh, it, do wow. it doesn't bother me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's an ongoing topic about management and it's funny because everybody has their own different experiences. Um, what I think I like about the conversation most right now about, about all three of us being able to tell different stories from different vantage points, not one of us have said anything about micromanagement. Not one of us has said anything about being the like hovering helicopter type boss. Right. Um, and, and I just... I've seen enough of that not work to the degree that that's not how I operate. Um, so, um, well, on that note, I, if I have to micromanage you, then you're going to be gone. There's already a problem. Yeah. Like yeah. that. I'm not, I'm just not going to do it. That just means it's not right. Yeah. I'm not doing that. Yeah. If I can't trust you, if I can't, yes, you have to do performance improvement plans and follow up and, and give feedback. Yes. But if I have to micromanage you, it, it, you're dead in the water. Yes, it's not happening. It's not yeah. happening. All right, that's it. Yeah. Episode number 13 is in the <laughs> books. Lucky 13. Thank you for joining us, Amanda. That was super fun. Thank you for having uh, me. We'll just take like a collective social media poll as to whether or not people want you back. No, that's not true. I'm totally joking. <laughs> um, well, yes. We are coming back uh, <laughs> next week. Do we have a topic for next week? It doesn't matter. I haven't figured it out, but we will come back. Um, and I appreciate your time. And this is episode number 13 on management for the Hire and Fire, Hire and Fire show with Pyra Consulting. You just got done listening to Hire and Fire, a production by Pyra Consulting. Please check us out online on either LinkedIn, Facebook, or our website at pyraconsulting.com. That's P-I-R-A consulting.com.